All right, welcome. We're going to get started uh, on the session on time here. Uh, so let me just introduce myself. Um, I'm Mark Nakakura. I'm the Cisco Security Account Manager. And I've been with Cisco for about uh, 11, almost 12 years in various positions as a SE, a Direct Account Manager, and, uh, and channels. So I've recently moved over to this role uh, about six months ago. Uh, and so today what we'll be covering is the next generation security model. And we'll be talking a lot about Cisco, um, our ASA and our source fire solution, as well as our advanced malware protection today. Um, so before I start, I just wanted to get, get an idea from the, from the folks in the room. How many of you folks are managed security tools, firewalls, next generation firewalls, IDSs? Anybody out here? Nope, okay. How many of you are traditional network support folks out here? Manage the little switch and router infrastructure? One or two? And then how about the rest of you? Do you um, are you involved in IT support in general, or uh, what are you folks inter interested in today or hearing about? Network support? How is it going to better uh, provide security for your organization? OK, well, we'll talk about some of these things today um, and what, how, if you want to look at how network security was looked at in the past, how you need to go and model your new security environment, where the threats are coming from. Um, so one of the areas that you can learn about what's going around in the industry is looking at the Cisco annual, annual security report. And this will provide you information about what's, what's happening in the industry regarding threat intelligence, uh, capabilities benchmark study, geopolitical and industry trends, and what's the changing view towards cybersecurity. So bottom line is what we found is that the attackers have become a lot more proficient in, um, in exploring the CVEs or the common vulnerabilities and, and ex exposure, and it's the 1% that they're targeting, right? So they're becoming become much more proficient at doing that. Um, Flash malware, Java is still actually the highest, uh, one of the highest incidents of uh, exploits, but we're seeing increases in other tools or other exploits like us, uh, Silverlight. Spam volume is not decreasing. Spam volume is actually increasing. It increased over 250% uh, this year, or I should say last year, to, in 2014, and it's becoming much more uh, sophisticated. Before, they used to send it from you know, one or two addresses. Now they're sending it from multiple addresses. So they're trying to spread the, um, the flow of spam coming through the network, and they're actually um, uh, trying to avoid the typical detection. Because before, we used to do reputation-based filtering. And we typically look at one IP address. But now it's coming from a couple uh, hundreds of IP addresses. So it's a little harder to, to detect. But we've come up with some new ways to, to uh, defend against that. So what is the biggest uh, threat out there? Well, it's not uh, typically the security staff, and not, not that they're not doing their job. It's actually the users and IT staff. They're becoming complicit in <clears throat> how they go and protect it, how they protect the network. So one of it is, hey, actually 50% of um, uh, devices out there are still vulnerable to heart bleed. So patch management is not being kept up. Uh, to make sure you secure your devices and OSs against known vulnerabilities. The biggest one right now is actually users, right? So their users are still going out to malware uh, sites that host known malware. They don't know. Or you get an email that comes in, and they're still clicking on a link, and they, they get themselves infected. Even though we have the tools that are getting better to detect it, Things will still sneak, sneak through, and the users are actually the ones that we need, to, um, in, uh, we need to educate and train on how to avoid uh, potential security breaches. So 
What we've also seen in the capabilities benchmark study is that they see their, the CSOs see their uh, tools extremely effective, but less, of the, less than 50% are using standard tools and patches to prevent breaches. Right? So how do we go about approaching the new threats that are coming out in the world? And part of it is looking at the attack continuum. So we look at it at before, during, and after. And this is across the attack plane or attack surface. That is increasing in the environment that we work with now, right? Before, we used to have just PCs and laptops to worry about and servers. Now, what else do we have in the surface attack plane that we need to look, look out for? Right? Mobile devices, tablets, IP surveillance ca cameras, the Internet of Things or Internet of Everything. Right? Everything is being connected to the Internet. It could be um, a home security cameras. It could be a smart appliance. It could be um, lighting and, and, and um, uh, uh, air conditioning systems. So they're all being con uh, connected, and that increases the surface attack plane. So if you look at the attack model on the before, this is where you typically, most organizations have focused their efforts on. How do I build up my walls? How do I build up you know, the biggest, um, hardest wall? And how do I actually control, enforce, and harden my perimeter from where the people are coming in? So what do you need to know before the attack? Well, you need to know what's there. You need the visibility. You can't protect what you can't see. Right? If you can't see what's out there, how do you know what's going on? So looking at it, you need to find out what devices, OSs you have, what your access control policies are, and this helps reduce the surface area of attack. On the during the part, part, that's where you detect block and defend. So this is where your IPSs and other devices come into play. So you, but you, in order to enforce that, you have to have some of the high efficacy price, uh, mechanisms to protect against that. And it must be multidimensional and correlated. OK, that's an important piece. So what do we mean by multidimensional? Well, it can't just be a firewall. It can't just be a next generation firewall that looks at applications. It can't just be your IPS. It can't just be your content filter, filter for web or email security. It can't just be your malware protection. right? You can buy all those tools. But if they're just siloed and they don't talk to each other to help you correlate, correlate that information on what's going on, you're not going to be effective in protecting your enterprise. right? Because attacks are becoming much more sophisticated. A lot of times, um, some of these sophisticated attacks are coming in. They're coming in low and slow. It takes typically months for, for you to detect it. Or actually, it may be a two-part attack. Maybe you go, the first part is the user downloads something through email. Could be in it something innocuous like a PDF file. And then they go visit a website that actually um, activates that piece of malware. So real quick, let's look at the after part here. So this is the important part that we're not most, we need to focus our efforts more on than the traditional before and during. We still need to put these pieces in place, but we have to look at the after piece, right? Now, why is that? Well, it's just not a matter of if, it's going to be a matter of when you're going to get breached. We, you know, John Chambers said there's two types of customers. There's the ones that have been attacked and breached, and the ones that don't know about it yet, right? So if we look at this on the, on the, the after cycle, excuse me, what, do we, what can we do to hype, help quickly discover, scope, contain, and remediate any potential threats quickly? Well, part of it is, the question is, long, like I said, no longer malware will get in your network. But where do you start? What do I need to do? Right? So you need to look at, on that attack continue, hey, M1, get notification, quarantine, triage, and, um, and figure out what's next. How bad is the situation? What's the scope? 
What systems were affected? What did it do? How do we recover from this? And how do we stop it from happening again? Right? You need to answer those, have those questions answered or part of your security strategy in place in order to be effective in your game plan on how to protect the bad guys, against yourself against, uh, against the bad guys. So when we look at the next generation security model, here are the pieces that belong to each of the different pieces of the attack continuum. So on the before piece, you look at your traditional firewall and your VPN products that protects your borders and, and networks and protocols. Your granular app control, that's where the next generation firewall capabilities come in play, like um, and to protect against, uh, to define what applications can get in or user activities. You know, how many of you know what the difference between a traditional firewall is and the next generation firewall is? Well, next generation fire firewall provides you that granular granular app control, right? For so, for example. You may, you, say, you may say, hey, everything can come in on port 80 for my web traffic. But a lot of applications use port 80 for their applications. So for example, Facebook, hey, maybe you want to allow your users to go and view their news feed, but maybe at work you don't want them to post status updates, do instant message chat, or um, you know, post uh, you know, geolocation informa information, especially in the DoD. Right? If someone's deployed outside, they don't wanna, you don't want um, to give uh, them information of where they're located in the world. It may be because of their own mission. The during piece is where your next generation IPS comes into place. So that's where you detect what's actually going on, get the latest attacks, uh, what's <clears throat> and how to prevent um, DDoS attacks, malware, and other things coming in. The web security piece and the email security piece is also part of that. As the information goes through or you're visiting websites, this is where the security intelligence comes in place, right? Without security intelligence of knowing what's bad out there, what's the latest threats, what's, where's the, where, where are the bad sites I shouldn't be going to, and what I need to watch out for, well, you need that information to feed your security tools to be able to update and protect against the latest threats. The after piece, and this is advanced malware. So actually, advanced malware can actually go throughout the entire attack continuum. So advanced malware protection will detect, hey, is a file known good, file known bad? If it's known bad, reject it. If it's good, let it through. But if it's unknown, what do we do about that? Well, so now you can send it to a sandbox for, for further file analysis, look at behavior indicators, and um, find out what's going on to determine whether or not you let it through, or, you, or if you let it through, and then go back and take a look at it again. Um, that's where the retrospective security comes into place. So we're looking at a continuous analysis so that we know that if we've downloaded something today and it wasn't known as zero day, zero day attack, but Five days later, we found out that it's the latest, um, uh, latest and greatest malware. You can go back and look at what devices or where it originated from, what devices downloaded it, where it may have spread through, and retrospectively go back to those devices to determine which ones have been impacted. So once again, you can scope, contain, and remediate and do your triage. And last piece is the indicators of compromise. So everything lines up, right? If you're, a, if you're a threat, this is what I talk about, the correlation. Do I have a known vulnerability on my enterprise? Have I downloaded or have I um, been, uh, any, are there any attacks coming in that may take advantage of that? Have I detected that and where is it, right? So if those things line up, you wanna have that known as a uh, high impact event that you need to take immediate um, uh, action to. So we talked about the intelligence piece. Now, how do we gather that intelligence to provide the updates for all your security tools? 
Well, Cisco Talos is our collective security intelligence organization. It's a combination of the Cisco in security intelligence organization and part of the vulnerability research team uh, from Sourcefire. So we purchased Sourcefire, uh, which is well known in the industry for, um, uh, for their I next generation IPS firewall and malware protection. Um, and now we integrated those two teams. So just to give you an idea of the breadth of our security intelligence, we have over 1.6 million global sensors, over 100 terabytes of information we look at every day. We monitor over a third of the world's emails. Uh, we look at over 13 billion web requests. We also, look, we also have the Snort and Clam AV open source communities. And then we also have honeypots and, uh, and our threat grid dynamic analysis. So we're pulling all that information in from customers, from our sensors that we put out there to determine exactly what's going on. So that's why we have you know, some of the best visibility out there and the quickest detection of um, the threats that are coming in. Now, if you look at this, we pull this in from these six sources, right? So from email, from endpoints, from web, from the networks, from the IPSs, and all devices. And that typically means your firewalls, your next generation firewalls, your IPS device, your content security. Um, and that's unique to, sit to, to security vendors in the industry. Because most of the security vendors out there may be doing one, maybe two, maybe three of them, but they don't do all of them. And if you can pull in the intelligence from all the different feeds, do your analysis, and then send out updates to all the security tools that you have out there, you're going to be much more effective in detecting what is going on. So what do you need to do and look at for next generation security? One is you have to do network discovery and connection awareness. So what does that mean? All right. You have to listen to see what's on your network. What OSs are you running? What host do you have out there? What type of appliances or, or devices? And where are they connected? Are they connected via a wired connection? Are they connected via wireless connection? How about VPN? Are they coming in through a, a cellular network? All right, so you need to determine the posture of uh, uh, whether these guys coming in. Um, so we look at the host discovery, we look at what applications look, they're running, and we're looking at what user is actually using that device at that time. So we pull all this information through passive discovery, integration with other services like Active Directory or things like network access control with uh, like our Cisco Identity uh, Services uh, engine as well as the next generation firewall capabilities and give you all of this information. It's probably a little hard to see back there, but um, I'll make sure the slides are available for you folks to download later on. So how do we discover it? So once again, one of it is using our next generation IPS IDS tool and it's called Firesight or Firepower, or you could also call it Sourcefire. We kind of use Sourcefire and Firepower interchangeably. Firepower is the new, the new name. So one, let's passively discover the network using the next generation IPS firewall. And we'll look at the connection events, the hosts, and we'll look at the profiles of all um, the machines on your network, what they're running, where they're going. So if you know the details of what's running your network, wouldn't this be helpful in, in providing context of actual, what's actually uh, accurate for alerting and reporting? And let me ask you a question. So what would be more important to you? And then raise your hands. Uh, for example, a code red, oops, excuse me. A code red attack running against a Linux box in your environment or a code red attack running uh, on a vulnerable, ver vulnerable version of Windows in your environment. Which one would you be more concerned with? Windows. 
Windows, good. Yeah, why? Because code writ doesn't affect Linux boxes, right? So think about that. Do your current security tools, are they smart enough to provide that type of correlation for indicators of compromise that line up? And typically not. They're typically going to say, hey, code red came in. Alert, alert, alert. Let me come in through your logs. Does that do you any good? Maybe. Is it a false positive? If it's on a Linux device, it's a false positive. If it's on a Windows device that you know you haven't patched for that vulnerability, yeah, it's important, very important, because you know you've been compromised. So with Firesight, what we can do based on those indicators of compromise and lining them up and providing the correlation, we can give you the Im different impact levels, right? Impact level um, zero, not on the network, or from four to one. So if you look at, um, let's say if it was uh, code red on that Linux machine, the host is uh, not running the service or protocol that was attacked. So that would be an impact level three. That would be nice to know, hey, we saw this threat come in, but it's not impactful to your network. But just check it out, just to let you know something's still getting through the system. It's the impact level ones that you should really focus your attention on, all right? Because the host is running the service of the protocol, it was attacked by the vulnerability that that service or protocol was mapped to. Okay, so that's, that's un very unique that you need to understand that when you're looking at trying to figure out what's important in the security alerts that you have coming in, do they line up? And then, for example, um, you've all heard about the target breach, right? So targets, their POS systems were compromised through some contractor that came in and plugged in their machine or, or USB uh, device. Okay, and that remained undiscovered for months, and then they had a bunch of uh, data exfiltrated. So did they know, did their, their security tools find that piece of malware that came in? that advanced persistent threat? Yeah, it actually did. They actually did detect that came in. The problem was that they had so much information coming in from all the different security tools coming into their security information manager or event manager that it was like finding a needle in a haystack. It didn't provide them the visibility that they need to determine that was an impact level one event nor did it provide them any uh, visibility on that piece of malware and if it had spread throughout the organization and have retrospectability to go back and take a look at where it went. So those are important things you need to take a look at. Um, so in the Firesight Management Center, it gives you a dashboard and it'll show you exactly, hey, these are the impactful events you need to look at. These are level one, and then you can drill down into these. If it's level two, hey, maybe not important, maybe we can look at it a little. But these are the 33 ones that I need to take a look at. Hey, was it blocked? If it was blocked, good. If it wasn't blocked, then you need to make sure you take some kind of remediation action against that. So why is next generation contextual awareness important? Well, it gives you real-time information on what's going on, right? It can't just be a point in time, it has to be continuous. Um, secondly is you need to always, you need to fine tune your policies. If you've ever managed an IPS and you, and you know there's signatures to be applied, you need to know which ones are important, right? So once again, back and getting back to um, looking at what's on your network, what OS is, what type of host, what type of devices, uh, what kind of known vulnerabilities are there? And based on that, the system can be smart enough to make rule recommendations of what you should turn on and turn off, right? Because you don't want to turn everything on because that causes more false positives than if you tune it correctly. 
right? But you don't want to not turn on all the things that you need, otherwise you might miss something. And that's, and that's, a, that's the skill of, uh, of a security analyst tuning in I, I, IDS. So one of the things that we have that's um, uh, uh, unique to the Firesight or Firepower um, solution is that we can provide rule recommendations based on your, your custom environment of what is appropriate to turn on or turn off. And you can apply it uh, based on, you know, if you want a low security posture or a higher security posture. And then once you can run that out, you can run it every day, every other day, once a week, we'll give you the rule recommendations, and then you can make your own choice whether or not you, not, you want to apply all the rules or just some of them. Okay, so we talked about the um, uh, IPS policies. So also you want to look at blocking or alert, uh, alert of un unauthorized examples, uh, excuse me, applications, or uh, going out to sites, right? So you want to be able to track what your users are doing and monitor and act on usual behavior. So for example, um, a lot of the threats are may, may not necessarily be from the outside, but if you're outside, they're acting as an insider to the organization. That's how some of these, like for Sony, the Sony attack, they came in, they laid low and slow, they were able to get user credentials, valid user credentials, um, as if they were an internal user to the network, right? That is like having an insider person logging in and exfiltrating data or going around and do bad stuff on, on the enterprise, right? So you want to be alerted to an un unusual network behavior. Maybe you want to look at base lighting um, your, your users. Hey, no, if anybody sends more than 100 meg of information a day, alert me, because that could be potential exfiltration of data. Or unusual uh, network uh, behavior based on what the, that device is doing or what that application is doing. For example, if you have a DNS server, it shouldn't be trying to SSH into your router or your server because that's not how a DNS server acts, right? So those are the things that you want to be able to monitor for. So just a quick snapshot of the Firesight Management System, uh, Center. This is what you typically get in your IPS, you know, uh, or next generation firewall, looking at the threats, the attacks, and anomalies. Your next generation firewall will look at the users, the web applications, the application protocols, um, and the files that it's transferring. But that's where it ends, right? You need to take a look at all these other pieces to provide you complete visibility into your network and determine what's the real threats out there. So look at, hey, do I have malware coming in? Do I have, are they con con uh, contacting command and control uh, servers? You need to get that from the intelligence feeds of where those command and control servers are out in, in the wild. Um, you know, what kind of mobile devices do you have out there? What kind of web browsers are you using? So all of this information provides you the visibility that you need to be able to see what's going on in your network. So a quick example is this host and event correlation. Uh, so once again, we saw, we looked, there was an event going on here off of this IP address. If, there was, if this was integrated uh, with Active Directory or uh, ICE, we'd be able to actually provide you the machine name, what user was on there at that time, and this is what happened. So these are the indicators of compromise so that we de determine this is impact level one. So we saw command and control going on here. We saw um, an intrusion attempted here, and we actually detected malware was downloaded. Right? So for the fact we detected malware was downloaded and we're seeing command and control signals going out, this is a pretty good indi indication of what's going on that you've been impacted. So a quick snapshot of the um, verified threats. So this shows you a um, quick sna snapshot 
dashboard of the uh, indication is compromised by host, where it came from from a reputation perspective, and the recent verified threats. And the ones you can even look, go down to what browser were, were they um, are verified by. Now, as you look at the um, threats that are coming in, which ones were blocked and which ones weren't? So if they were blocked, you can validate that, hey, I'm OK. If it wasn't blocked, then you probably need to take some triage or remediation action. So let's walk through what would happen if you had malware detected and what are the steps that you would do to prevent that from impacting your network. So we look at the network traffic here, right? And it's going through your next generation firewall, IPS, <clears throat> and it captures a file. Now it's going to go and look at, is this known good? If it's good, let it through. If it's known bad, block it. And how do we start to determine that? Well, we determine that with fingerprinting, right? Everybody has a unique fingerprint. Well, files have a unique fingerprint also. Look at the SHA-256 or the MD5 hash, determine whether it's good or bad. We're also going to determine where we kind of think it might be bad. We do some fuzzy logic on it. To, um, if it's close to that uh, bad fingerprint hash, we could make a uh, policy decision to block or let it through. Or maybe send it up for file analysis. Right, so we'll store that file. And now let's send it up to the collective in, uh, security intelligence sandbox, if it's unknown. From here, we can analyze that file. So we can have it play out. And we can look at the um, up to 350 behavior indi indicators and billions of art uh, malware artifacts that will help us to determine whether or not that file may be malicious or not. All right? So that's how you can go about looking at the unknowns. And typically, this might take anywhere from 5 to 20 minutes per file, depending on how, how complex it is. But it's important to look at your um, malware protection vendor in terms of what they do to have that file play out in that sandbox. And why is that? Well, you know, as we get one step ahead, the, uh, the, the bad guys get another step ahead. So they're getting smarter. Malware comes in, and they're getting smart that, hey, you're running in a VM environment. We know they're being sandboxed. So they will actually sleep until you do specific, specific actions. And we have some unique patented technology to kind of poke that, that file to execute to make it do the things that you know, it was intended to do, which is compromise your network. Right? So for example, um, if you're running in a VMware environment, maybe it was just an EXE or something to that effect, you uh, execute it, and it makes all the changes, and it looks innocuous. Right? But it may not actually run, the malware may not actually run, until you do certain actions. So for example, it may look for mouse movement. It may look for your screen survey to go on. It may look for you actually have uh, executing Outlook, because everybody has some kind of email client on their machine. Then they know it's a valid user, right? So look at th those technologies in the vendors that you evaluate if you're going to be imp implementing sandbox technology in your environment. So if we detect that this is known malware, then we'll send it down, and now we'll send a malware alert. So from what do you do from here? Right? You had it, a file captured. It sent it up to the sandbox. It was from this one host, and now we alerted you. Does it help if I just alert you for that one host that's been impacted? Or do you want to know all the other hosts 
that may been, have been impacted that it may have spread to. Probably want to know all about the whole, other whole set it spread to, right? Right? So that's what we talk about. It's, it's you know, the continuous attack continu continuum. We took, a, we took a point in time of this, but now you want to go back to the system to make sure that it can track what other hosts it may have compromised. And this is what we call retrospective file tra uh, tracking. So for example here, this shows that on this, this day, March 7th at uh, 2025, host 10.1.31.13.187 had downloaded this. Okay, and in this case, we know immediately that it was known malware. But now we have the file trajectory of what other hosts it impacted throughout your network and how it transmitted from one to the other. Right? So now you have a complete history of, hey, I know it started here. This was patient zero, but it went to 10.221, then 250, 250 and so forth. So now I know all of these hosts are the ones in my scope that it impacted us, right? These are the ones I need to go and contain. So how do you contain them? Well, either you do it the old-fashioned way, you try to figure out what users were logged in to these machines at that time, and sometimes it's more challenging because you're using DHCP, right? And you may not have the same IP address every day. But also, um, <clears throat> uh, where are they actually located on your network? How are they connected? Are they connected to a switch port, wireless access point, remote VPN in? What building, what floor, what switch? Who, who's the user? Who do I have to contact? So if you have to do that for, it let's, looks, looks, like, looks like about, what, 10 or 15 devices, that probably is going to take you all day to figure out who it is, contact those people, tell them, unplug yourself from the network, and do your remediation action. If your antivirus, anti-malware um, system can remove that, great. It may or may not. Uh, but a lot of times, you may just have to remediate your, your entire machine, right? So if you can pre prevent that from happening in the first place and detecting it early on, you can in, uh, reduce the, the amount of work that you have to do for the triage. The other piece is that if you have something like an um, advanced mail protection client loaded on the endpoint, that's always tracking what files are loaded and what was done. And so with, uh, along with our Firesight Manager and Firepower Services that run on the ASA platform or a standalone. We had advanced malware protection also that runs on the endpoint or the host to detect what's going on. And then you can go and simply click on, a, um, click on Firesight Manager to say, hey, remove this malware from all these infected hosts, and now you've remediated all of those uh, um, compromised clients. So once again, looking at the attack continuum, right? So the before, providing you the uh, contextual awareness, the during, the inline protect, protection and prevention and the file execution blocking. But the after piece is now the piece that we need to focus in on. And you need to look at the file retrospective, the file directory, the file analysis, and the indicated, indicators of, of compromise and out, outbreak control. So let's put this all together on the different components of what the next generation security models should look like. And this is going to look like a little bit of an eye chart, um, but don't let, it, don't let it scare you because all these capabilities are being integrated into um, one platform or a few platforms that actually start, that integrate and talk to each other. 
So let's back up here. So first you have your typical stateful firewall, right? If you have an ASA or some other firewall out there, that will typically, that set, that'll protect your, your enterprise on the typical network ports and protocols. Hey, block FTP, block FT, uh, uh, TFTP, telnet traffic, what might, uh, whatever uh, protocols that you don't want to allow into your network. Layer on top of that, your IPS capabilities, your application visibility, your web content controls, your antivirus and basic protections, and then get user identity, right? Figure out who's on your network. And that be, could be as simple as integrating with Active Directory, but it's probably better if you have some kind of identity services or network access control integrated into your environment, right? Once again, you can't protect what you can't see, and you want, need to know where, who, and what is plugged into your network. The other thing, too, is you don't want to just have open ports for anybody to plug into your enterprise environment, right? Would you, would, you, um, would you allow an open access point on your enterprise um, to be able to connect up to your, to your network, unencrypted? Probably not, right? That's why you encrypt your, your access points or your SSIDs, either with uh, WPA or better yet, if you can have them authenticate, use 802.1x. So you want to treat that the same for your wire ports, right? Because anybody, if, if they have access to your physical office space, they could simply plug in, and now they're on your network. So you need to uh, also implement, implement that from a port security perspective. So that's typically all the stuff you get in the next generation firewall. So how do you get that contextual device, network, and one point visibility. So the additional pieces are with the vulnerability management, that's with the security intelligence, the behaviors are compromised, the, the advanced malware protection, and the client um, uh, anti-malware also. So getting that information. On top of the next generation IPS, the malware file trajectory, the host trajectory, retrospective detection and analysis, and this is another one here. So this is something I want to look at also. There are new applications coming out all the time, and you may have custom ones that run in your network. Um, the, the next generation firewall vendors that are coming out. You know, one will say, hey, I've got 2,000 applications defined. Another one will say, I have 3,000. Uh, with Open App ID, now you can customize your own application signature for detection in your network um, to have additional controls over your traffic. And once again, with the collective uh, security intelligence with our Talos organization, you get all this additional information. So URL and uh, IP reputation, dynamic outbreak controls, and with that, the sandboxing to get to the information of, hey, what's the latest and greatest threats out there? Right? And that's what is going to get pulled in and fed to these devices around here to provide you the latest and greatest updates of what the latest outbreak attacks or how to defend yourselves from, from that uh, impacting your network. And this is how you create that integrated threat defense system. So that's the next generation security model. It's once again, it's not just these siloed products. It's all the products working together as an integrated system, sharing that. So if you do get uh, impacted, you have the capability of sending it uh, one determining with an impact level one event, taking um, immediate action or actionable intelligence on what your remediation or triage plan is. And if you can automate that with components to uh, put in a quarantine VNAT automatically, 
and do your, your triage remediation, that puts you one step ahead of the bad guys. All right? So that's all I had for today. Uh, any questions? <laughs>